Twice a year, Barnes & Noble has a month-long sale on DVDs and Blu-rays in the Criterion Collection. In this July's sale, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to get. My dad had recently given me some cash after I'd visited with my parents and in-laws for our annual summer vacation, so I had a budget and a list of movies I wanted to buy. I'd already picked up Hedvig and the Angry Inch, The Passion of the Joan of Arc, Seven Samurai, The In-Laws, and F for Fake, all of which are great movies, but my other choices were out of stock, so I decided to try something a little bit different. I've often told people that any movie in the Criterion Collection is probably worth your time, so I decided to put that theory to the test. I pulled up an app on my phone and generated some random numbers, between one and a thousand. Each Criterion Collection has the order in which it came out printed on the spine of the case. Most of the time the numbers don't have anything special about them, with the exceptions like uh, the Devil's Backbone being spined 666. Get it? So I spun up some random numbers with the intent of blind buying any movies that were available on that list. I ended up with A Taste of Honey, Stranger Than Paradise, The Four Feathers, and Mean Time. Stranger Than Paradise was the only one I'd ever heard of. Uh, it's that first film by that uh, Jim Jarmusch guy. He does zombie movies now. Anyway, that's probably too much backstory for now. How do you make a Dungeons & Dragons movie? It's a question that's been answered by Hollywood a couple times, kind of. There was that movie called Dungeons & Dragons, starring Justin Whalen and Martin Wayans, and it's, um, I'm sorry, it's two sequels? They made two sequels to that movie. Didn't know that. Okay, um, yeah, those are D&D movies, I guess. Uh, although they were officially licensed, they didn't really have any connection to the game, let alone the literal mountains of lore that has been created for the system. They're basically mediocre fantasy movies with a Dungeons & Dragons label slapped on top. Or hey, there's The Last Witch Hunter, which is largely based on a character that Vin Diesel actually played in his home D&D campaign. I haven't seen The Last Witch Hunter, but I have read the entirety of the TV Tropes page, so I can say with absolutely no confidence that uh, it comes across as an elaborate self-insert fan fiction, which, I mean, actually does kind of make it feel like a D&D campaign gone awry. A Dungeons & Dragons movie doesn't need Dungeons & Dragons to be successful as such. Because D&D isn't the setting, but rather it's the process. Dungeons & Dragons is a game. I don't have time for the entire history of RPGs, role-playing games, but the super short version that gives a little too much credit to a single white guy is there was this war game called Chainmail. In it, people pitted fantasy armies against each other. One of the guys who created Chainmail wondered what it would be like to play a game where you could pretend to be the individual units rather than the whole army all at once. He made a game about that, and it was called Dungeons & Dragons. People liked it. People liked it so much more they came up with other games like it. And there's now hundreds of games where you can play pretend in different worlds with different rules. You could be a crew on a spaceship, or you can uncover the deep unknowable truths of the universe. Or you can be superheroes, or you can be horny teenage werewolves and vampires and ghosts. If you want to play pretend as an adult in a socially acceptable way, there's an RPG for that. The rhythm of the game is this. The Dungeon Master starts with a scenario for the characters to encounter. Sometimes the scenarios are pre-published adventures, and sometimes they're made up entirely by the DM. The players bring their characters, often with elaborate backstories made up by them. The Dungeon Master will start by describing the world around the players, then the players describe what their characters do, and then the Dungeon Master explains how the situation has changed based on their actions. This can take the form of dialogue between characters or more action-oriented situations like trying to escape a dungeon or fight a dragon. The Dungeon Master is responsible for creating the world the other players inhabit, reacting to their decisions, and throwing problems in their way. Sometimes the DM will have a general idea of where the story is going to go, but they allow the players to really control the direction the story takes. If the player doesn't open that door, we never learn what's behind it. It's a collaborative process. There's lots of give and take on both sides of the table. Because really, when you get down to it, playing these RPGs is just telling a story with your friends. The best moments happen at the table, and they're often completely unexpected. I personally think why there's, that's why there's been this increased fan base building around various actual play RPG shows. There's shows like The Adventure Zone, Critical Role, and my personal favorite, The Sea Team, show people sitting down to play these games. Often Dungeons & Dragons, but not always. You can see the improvisations happening in front of you. You can feel the tension riding on a particularly important die roll. Or you can laugh as poor decisions come back to haunt the party. Role-playing games are a process, not just something that spits out a story in the end. So, 
One way you could make a compelling D&D &D movie might be to show this process in action. Look at season one of Stranger Things, and only season one of Stranger Things, or the episode of Community that is just the characters sitting around their library tables playing Dungeons & Dragons. These narratives capture what it feels like to play the game better than any licensed work really ever has, in my opinion. But what if there's other ways? What are other ways we could do it? Well, we could look at improvisation. RPGs are improvised, so what if we improvised a movie? Has that ever been done before? Well, yeah, of course it has. Uh, in the 2000s, there was this trend in filmmaking called retroscripting. The idea was to create a more real realistic dialogue by allowing actors to improvise their lines in the moment based on rough outlines of these scenes, rather than having a scripted formal definition of what they were going to say. Like all definitions, the definition of retroscripting is a little bit fuzzy and it's hard to pinpoint exactly what movies use it. Uh, for example, the movie Spinal Tap, which came out way before retroscripting was even a word people used, was entirely improvised by its cast, to the point that the director, Rob Reiner, did his best to have the entire cast credited as writers on the film. Eventually, because of some union rules, they could only credit the, uh, the core members of the band and Rob Reiner himself, but really everyone is involved in that process. Or there's the mumblecore movement in indie film, where there's script in place. Or there's sitcoms like Curb Your Enthusiasm and Reno 911 that work from these outlines, but allow the dialogue to be created on the spot. Those processes are all well known because the productions make them known, even when it's not immediately obvious that's what's going on. It's interesting to me that most of these examples, though, are comedies, uh, which is true of improv and theater as well. It's always sort of comedic. Is improvising comedy easier? I don't know, but I think comedies can get away with being a little shaggier around the edges and looser with structure if the jokes are good. Just watch the outtakes on any Judd Apatow movie and see the, how the actors try out dozens of different jokes, knowing full well the editors can just grab the best ones. Usually these jokes don't have a lot of bearing on the rest of the story. They're just there. I wouldn't even ask you to think of weird, crazy celebrity names for my kid. Like Dakota, Data Fiction, Pontius Pear Slice, or Adia Delto Force, Meringue Sherbert, Pear Glow, Lance Dog, or anything weird like that. You want a good time? You go to Disneyland, all right? Go to freaking Bush Gardens. Go to Korea. Go to my apartment. It's phenomenal. Go to Grand Canyon. Go to peyote at Joshua Tree. Go to Vietnam. Go to Burning Man. Go see Duran Duran. Go see Celine Dion in Vegas. Here's a new birth plan. Deliver the baby safely. But I think there's another way to make a Dungeons and Dragons movie, and that someone's been making what I would call role-playing game movies for decades. Uh, let's talk about Mean Time. Mean Time is a movie written and directed by Mike Lee in 1983 for England's Channel 4. It's technically a TV movie, but that really just means it was shot on 16 millimeter film instead of 35 and was shown on Channel 4 instead of being released into theaters. It also showed at the London Film Festival and the Berlin International Film Festival after that initial release. Meantime depicts a family in what was then present day England, uh, three of whom were living on the dole, getting regular unemployment payments from the government. When the film was made, unemployment in England was around 11.9%. Thanks, Thatcher. So this particular family unit wasn't that unusual. I can tell you what happens in the movie, but the plot isn't as important as the characters and the sort of tapestry that they create together. There's husband and wife, Frank and Mavis, played by Jeff Roberts and Pam Ferris. Their two sons, Mark and Colin, played by Phil Daniels and Tim Roth. Mark is smart and brash, but would rather make up stories than acknowledge his own reality. Whereas Colin is quiet and awkward and unsure how to exist in the world. The boys are friends with Coxie, a skinhead, played by Gary Oldman in his first film role. Yeah, all right. I'm a what? You a what? And Haley, a neighborhood girl that Colin likes, but is just a little bit too shy to really express himself about. These characters meander from place to place with very little to fill their days. Uh, these characters also intersect with Auntie Barbara and Uncle John, played by Marion Bailey and Alfred Molina, respectively. John doesn't particularly like Colin or Mark, but Barbara is fond of them and actually offers Colin a job to paint her house. We see these characters going about their lives with very little purpose. If the film is about anything, it's about what do people do when there's nothing to do. We see them doing laundry, watching TV, hanging out at a bar, playing games, 
and collecting unemployment. There's other vignettes as well, like a quick visit with Haley's neighbor who argues with her boyfriend about a stroller he brought home. But none of these characters, none of these people fit any sort of Campbellian hero with a thousand faces archetype and the story of the hero's journey. We just spend time with them and they go on existing. But did Mike Lee write this film? Well, that's what it says on the tin, but that depends on what we mean when we say someone wrote a film. Usually when we say that, it means that someone sat down and wrote a screenplay. Of course, due to the technical difficulties of actually making a movie, it's rare that what a screenwriter puts on paper has any particular resemblance to what ends up on the screen. We even heard a rumor that Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas wasn't based on a screenplay at all, but rather a particularly complex dress form. I'm reasonably confident there wasn't a screenplay ever in existence for Meantime, and that's because of Mike Lee's process. Mike Lee is a dungeon master, and he's running the world's most complicated role-playing game. When Mike Lee starts work on a film, he brings this whole cast together for a meeting, and he says, hey cast, these are all the people that are gonna be in the movie with you. In six weeks from now, we're gonna start filming. Then he separates them. Lee sits down with each actor for hours at a time, developing the characters that they're going to play. He works with them to build out complex histories for the character, exploring moments in their life and even encouraging them to go out in public occasionally to get a feel for how that character exists in the world. They move chronologically through the character's life over multiple sessions, building out a rich history of who they are. In the way that he likes to invent all the backstory, we invented a love affair for her and a fiance. And Mike came in one day and said, well, one day she's waiting for him and he doesn't turn up. Because <laughs> <laughs> Mike's in charge of that, you know, he's the puppeteer. Yeah. And then strategic moments when other people enter the character's lives, the actor playing that character is then reintroduced to the actor who is playing the character they just met. That left her, of course, looking, she was on the, re, you know, looking for the, a, a rebound romance, as it were, which turned out to be, next thing I knew, Fred Molina was in the room and our characters were working together. And had you met him before? No. No, okay. From there, they do character work in pairs or trios, adding in new people as they meet other people in their lives. The whole point of which is to explore who these characters are and what their relationships are. These meetings continue, with the actors only ever interacting with other people who their character would know, and then Lee starts crafting this rehearsal work into scenes that the actors work through, still improvising their dialogue and their reactions based on the characters as they've created them. At some point, Mike Lee starts actually filming these things. He films the scenes as they naturally happen, but allow the stories to develop naturally. While working on Meantime, for example, a character, Colin, played by Tim Roth, decides to shave his head towards the end of the film. This was something that happened on set after lots of filming had already happened. Lee and the actor went to a barber shop and shaved his head. But Tim Roth decided to keep his coat and his hood up when they returned to set. So they did this improvisation with him and his hood up and the rest of the family reacting to him. Uh, they did it for like seven hours. They just kept rehearsing and he had set up the whole time and the rest of the family didn't really know what was going on. It was only after hours and hours of this that they convinced the character Colin to remove his hood and the rest of the family could see his new shaved head. Now this isn't something the directors like normally do in Hollywood or if they do it's because they're trying to shock their actress and you know provoke a real reaction rather than trusting the actors to do their frigging jobs. But there was no script dictating that that would happen, that Colin would shave his head. It was just an authentic moment that came out of who this character was and how he reacted to the world. So did Mike Lee write the film? Sure, in the sense that he had final creative control over the narrative, but the rest of the cast had quite a big a bit of impact as well. So we could call the movie improvised, but that doesn't seem like it really gives credit to the right people. Something like Colin shaving his head only comes out of a collaborative process. Just like in Dungeons and Dragons, Mike Lee set up the scenario, but allowed his players slash actors to react to the situation naturally and see what comes out of it. The Criterion Collection, of which Meantime is a part, is a home video distribution company that's been around since 1984, not long after this movie came out, and in, has since become my primary source for high quality physical media releases. As they put it in their mission statement, the Criterion Collection is dedicated to publishing important classic and contemporary films from around the world, in editions that offer the highest technical quality, award-winning supplements, 
no matter the medium. From Laserdisc to DVD and Blu-ray to streaming, Criterion has maintained its pioneering commitment to presenting each film as its maker would want it seen. In state-of-the-art restorations with special features designed to encourage repeated watching and deepen the viewer's appreciation of the art of film. It's a lot. I first discovered the Criterion Collection when I was about 16 years old, working at Barnes & Noble to make money so I could buy more books. I didn't really know what this whole Criterion thing was, but I did know twice a year our DVD section got swarmed by people paying half price for what I consider to be very overpriced movies. $40 for a movie I've never heard of? No thanks. Especially when my DVD collection process at the time consisted of whatever I could find in the $5 bin at Walmart, or the used movie sales that my local Blockbuster had where I could buy five movies for 20 bucks. Sure, I ended up rounding out my batches of five with low-budget rejects like See This Movie, a mockumentary about the creation of itself, starring a couple of uh, unknown actors named um, John Cho and Seth Meyers. I huh, wonder what happened to them. But sometimes you gotta fill your basket with garbage to make sure you get a good deal on basketball. So I thought it was ridiculous to spend even 20 bucks on a movie in the Criterion Collection. One of my coworkers tried to explain it to me, but I was way more focused on value over quality. Until I found out that Chasing Amy was in the Criterion Collection. I'd recently discovered Kevin Smith through Dogma and had quickly decided I wanted to own all of his movies. But Chasing Amy was expensive because it was in this mythical collection. But eventually I bought it at one of these Barnes & Noble sales and that's how I got started collecting them. Once the hooks were in me and I start watching all of the incredible supplements that come with the movies, it just clicked. The movies are all great, even some of the ones people don't like, but going behind the scenes with these comprehensive interviews and essays and featurettes just deepens my appreciation for the movies. The more I know about the movies, the more I like them. I've since gone from that initial purchase of Chasing Amy to a couple dozen films in the collection, in my collection, and there are easily a hundred more that I want to buy eventually. No, I don't have the cash to buy them very often, so most of the time I just borrow them from my local library. That's just too much unnecessary background. Or is it? The theory I'm putting forward, that Mike Lee is a dungeon master as much as he is a director, can stand on its own. You can either agree with it or not. But now, you know a little bit more about me, and how I came to discover this movie, and I, now like Mike Lee's characters, have a slightly richer backstory with years of history built up. You only get to see this moment between us, and I'm making it happen as honestly as I can, but also maybe by seeing behind the curtain a little bit, we can see that everybody is like a character in a Mike Lee movie. We're all people with more going on than you'd ever know or understand. I lost my job about a month before this July Criterion sale. I was laid off. I expected it to be a temporary situation. I mean, all situations are temporary if you wait long enough. But I'd been excited about this sale, and I wanted to pick up some movies. I had a little bit of spare cash, and I'd been looking forward to the sale for months, and I kind of felt like pretending things were still normal might help them feel normal for a little bit longer. So I spun a digital wheel and ended up with this movie about unemployment in my basket. I didn't know what to expect, but what I got showed me that I'm not alone. And in the months that have gone by, and I still haven't gotten a job since then, this movie keeps popping back up in my head. Because what do you do when there's nothing to do, day in and day out? I do laundry, watch TV, I go to the bar with my friends, I play games, and I collect unemployment. That's the thing about characters in a Mike Lee movie. They're people, not characters. Their lives keep going on, and things rarely end up where you expect it to th them to be. When I remember that, I'm able to be a little bit kinder to my neighbors. I'm more likely to remember that people are living stories that I can't see. But we're all rich inside, full of rich backstory and history. Ooh. Mike Lee's movies help me see the humanity in everyone else. Maybe they'll do the same for you. I honestly think it's the highest praise I can give something is that it makes us more empathetic. Small things become big things.